All good. So hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Rose Guth. I'm the executive director of the Leo Marshut School of Painting and Drawing. And we are so thrilled today to have Samantha Van Heest, our featured artist of February, doing an artist talk with us today. Um, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to give a very brief intro um, to Samantha, and then I'm going to turn it over to her to give her talk and show some images of her work and tell her story. And then at the end, we'll open it up for questions um, and discussion and, and all of that good stuff. So um, let me just give a very brief introduction to um, Samantha, and then I'll hand it over to her because she's the one you came here to hear. Um, so Samantha is an artist and educator currently residing in the greater Washington DC area. Um, she has exhibited her work across the US and in France and her first debut solo exhibition, Deep Clean, um, just closed up this month in February at the UM Gallery in Washington DC. Um, Samantha is a graduate of Mary Washington University and she first encountered um, the Marshute School in the summer of 2018 when she came to X and she's been um, connected with the Marshutes community ever since. And we are so delighted to have Samantha featured this month and so happy to have her um, doing a talk with us today. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Samantha and let you hear from her. Awesome, thank you so much, Rose. Um, I am really excited to talk to you all today. Um, and then hopefully towards the end, we'll be able to kind of chat a little bit and do some question answers. Um, but in the meantime, I have a PowerPoint, so I'm gonna pull that up really quickly. So just bear with me while I, while I get it set for you all. Um, and then Rose can let me know if we can all see it. <laughs> Looks good, I can see it. Perfect. Um, well, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, I, like Rose said, um, I am a practicing artist and art educator in the DC area. Um, I'm located in uh, Northern Virginia, so right on the edge of DC. Um, and I've been a practicing artist, I guess, you know, since since grad, since 2020. Um, and I first um, encountered Marshoots in 2018, the summer of 2018. So it was a little a little while back now, I was talking about it with one of my one of my good friends from the program um, about how, you know, we're reaching on our five year anniversary. And that's a little that's so strange feeling because it feel like it happened, you know, just this past summer. Um, but it was a really beautiful experience. I had the wonderful opportunity of receiving a scholarship from my university, from UMW, um, called the Rosalie Chauncey Memorial Scholarship, which is gifted to um, a student who is particularly interested in painting and drawing. Um, and the outline is essentially, you know, as long as you study somewhere in France, that's all that matters. Um, and I had heard such incredible things about Marshoots. Um, and, you know, of course, I was doing all this re research, seeing what was available out there. Um, and I was really particularly drawn to the fact that it was just such a small, tight knit community um, and really, really focused on kind of the, the observational side of, of painting and drawing um, and really focusing in on just what is directly in front of you, what is surrounding you, kind of what are the emotions based with that. And that was um, that was really cool. And so I decided that this was the right direction for me. Um, I was terrified to travel to France. I hadn't been out of the country um, without my family with me um, and had never been to France before. Um, and I, um, I'm a very naturally anxious person. And so, you know, knowing that I had to kind of travel and do all this on my own, I was like paralyzed with anxiety for the three days prior to actually traveling. Um, but upon arriving in X, it just very quickly kind of subsided. Um, and I think actually getting to, you know, first meet um, you know, for instance, Alan and John and all my other like wonderful um, cohort at the at Marshoots was just really, you know, empowering and just like, okay, I can do this. I'm so comfortable painting and drawing and now I get to just explore it out in nature. And that was um, 
super wonderful. And so here are just some, some quick shots of, you know, the first few painting exercises that we did at the school. Um, and I, as, as you will see, you know, throughout the presentation, I am not necessarily a landscape painter and I definitely hadn't done really any of it prior to, to coming to Marsh Shoots. Um, and so this was all brand new to me, you know, really focusing in on like a whole motif was, was uh, just nothing, I was not comfortable with it. Um, and that was really exciting to be able to finally explore it for the first time. Um, and here are, you know, the beautiful landscapes that we would travel to. Um, I, you know, now that I had dug up these photos, you can tell that even five years ago, the quality of photos is different. <laughs> um, very grainy, but um, one of my wonderful friends uh, in the program captured these photos of me painting. Um, and it's really exciting because, you know, this is exactly what I was painting was just what was in front of me, capturing that, really focusing in on, you know, the the color around me. I remember something so distinctly about um, our conversations where, where John would come around and look into, you know, the mountain into Mount St. Victoire and say, like, don't you see all the violets that are in there? You have to pull those out. And so after that, after he would share that with me, I was like, oh man, I, there's so much more to it than just the local color that's coming out. Um, and that was really, I think, very transformative in my practice was starting to realize the amount of colorful depth that was in each intricate detail. Um, and so that was, you know, that was something that really, really stuck with me. And I think totally changed how I worked in the following five years and probably for the rest of my life. Um, and yeah, so here is a, a little, you know, shot of, I think this was our midway critique. Um, it seems about right, because I feel like, you know, I did my at the end of review with Alan, and I feel like a lot of these, he was like, let's go in a different direction. <laughs> let's maybe focus on, you know, the, the pieces that are super colorful and vibrant and maybe were completely different from what I had been doing and what I was comfortable with. And so that was really, that was really exciting. Um, and also strange because I hadn't had feedback like that before. Um, and so it was nice to, to be able to see things in a new perspective, see my work in a new perspective. Um, but yeah, and so this was just overall, you know, Marshoots was a completely, it was, it was an entire challenge from my usual comfort zone. It was just something that I had never done before. Um, and I, I've definitely, you know, explored the landscape since then. Um, but it has still everything that I've learned has seeped into to my latest work. Um, so here is an example of some of my work that I was doing um, in undergrad. Um, so when I went back to school um, that following uh, semester, so it would be fall of 2018, um, I started continuing. I was kind of exploring all sorts of topics. I was thinking about uh, portraiture. I was thinking about landscape a little bit more. Um, I was thinking about still life. I was thinking about um, like animal based art, um, but I hadn't really landed on a specific theme that I was interested in. Um, I was definitely starting to realize that I was more captivated by the general item or object or motif that was going on in the piece rather than uh, focusing in on a background. I really wanted there to be the central point, um, but I hadn't necessarily realized why yet that I wanted to, you know, focus in on just the raw canvas or really have this, this negative space that was living in the piece um, and was super intentional. That came later on, but I first had to, to try it out and kind of, you know, sit with it and realize why I liked it. Took me about a year to figure out. <laughs> um, but this was, you know, this was good. I was starting to learn, um, a little bit more about who I was as a painter. Um, I realized that 
everything I learned in Marshoots was starting to come back in. I was starting to explore this wide variety of color. Um, even you can see like in this, in this red plant over here, I think otherwise I would have explored it more as, you know, the reds and pinks, but I'm starting to get hints of that, of that John Violet over here. And we're getting some of the yellows. And I was really starting to look at it from the perspective of where is the light hitting and, um, and what kind of colors come out from that? Where is the contrast coming from? Um, and so this is kind of where, where my work really started to not necessarily solidify, but, but kind of come into the shape that it has been for, for the past five years. Um, after this, I had the great opportunity of the following summer working for the artist Amy Sherald, um, and I definitely would not have gone for this internship for having even just reached out for her had it not been for kind of this this motivational aspect of oh well I last summer I you know traveled to a country that. I did not know the language of, even though I took French for like four years at that point. Um, <laughs> still did not know the language, it's fine. Um, but I was like, you know what, I can, I can move to New York, I can um, work with this artist as long as I just put it out there that I'm interested. And it ended up being a really great and transformative experience too. Um, it was really exciting getting another summer to, to work with active artists and kind of see um, what it's like to have a studio practice, what it's like to make your entire living your passion. Um, and it was really scary, I think, too, because at this point I had fully decided that I'm going to be a studio art major, that I wanted to eventually um, pursue studio art as my main career path. Um, but I think like many artists feel they, they get that societal pressure of, oh, the starving artist narrative, or, you know, this is not something that you can really do unless you were a child prodigy or for this reason or that reason. Um, but then I got to start really being around people who were making this happen and who did not have the easiest path of getting there, but they were still, you know, pushing forward. And so that was, that was very important to me. Um, and especially going into my senior year of college about to, you know, come out on the other side and start looking at jobs. Um, and so I was starting to work a little bit more on my um, thesis practice. And around this point was when I started to discover that I really loved the concept of still life. I, um, was seeing a lot more of, you know, the study of people. I was seeing this portraiture, but through objects instead. So rather than, you know, having the actual person visible, it was like, how could I portray them and get their general um, energy showing through objects instead? Even if those objects aren't directly theirs, even if, you know, it doesn't look like their day to day? How can it still feel like a person um, or feel like a person has touched the scene? Um, and so I start exploring that in my works. Um, and around this time was uh, March of 2020. So this is when the pandemic started to hit. And um, everything kind of, I think everyone who graduated at this time had the same narrative where uh they it all collapsed you know you weren't able to go back to school for us studio art majors we didn't have access to a studio anymore I moved back home with my parents um so I was away from my classroom and my cohort my studio my bedroom became my studio um and so everything really changed um in that regard and I think also as a you know young adult who is about to enter the workforce this was really scary because I didn't know what I was going to do, but now there were way less options. Um, and the art world took a big hit at this point because, you know, it was not considered the most essential at the time. Um, and even though everyone ended up turning towards the arts um, as some sort of refuge at this time, it was still really hard to find a career path. Um, and so I continued working from my studio bedroom, uh, but it was definitely harder. You know, I didn't have the same feedback that I had had um, with my classmates nearby or with my professors. You know, I could reach out to them, but it wasn't the same as them viewing it in person or, you know, being able to just be around that creative energy. Um, 
And so I graduated, not in the, you know, most ideal of ways, but it happened. Um, And I was just kind of, you know, left to my own devices. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I originally had thought I would, you know, relocate or work for an artist or continue that studio practice. Um, But that wasn't really an option anymore. Um, And so I ended up... uh, finding a position at a local art school. So it was a, it was a private arts school that, um, you know, was focusing on all sorts of things, but I ended up teaching painting and drawing. Um, and this was my first time really ever teaching. I had done some private lessons here and there when I was in college. Um, and, you know, of course, if my friends who weren't in the arts department wanted to do like a paint night and had questions for me, I would answer. Um, but this was this was the first time that I, I got to teach at a professional level. Um, and this was really exciting because. I did not think I would enjoy teaching, to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't think that I would be comfortable with it. I did not find myself as the most, you know, social or outgoing person. And so I was like, how do I, how do I navigate being in a full classroom? Um, And how do I navigate working with people that are at all sorts of skill levels when I've been painting for a period of time, but then some of these students would come in with never having held a paintbrush. Um, But it ended up being a really rewarding experience. I still teach to this day, um, just now more so than I thought I would originally. And this was really, you know, a saving grace, I think, during the pandemic, because I was able to, you know, safely, of course, go back into the classroom, um, but then also be around other creative individuals, um, no matter the level of work they were doing. It was very inspiring and it was keeping me, I think keeping me working on my own work. You know, if I, if I wasn't at home, then I would be letting down my students because I wasn't keeping myself fresh. I wasn't keeping myself practicing. Um, and so I had to, I had to do it. Um, but then also more importantly, I really wanted to, you know, my students were thinking of really exciting ideas or they were working on projects that I had worked on a while ago. And so they were bringing back these really great memories. Um, And so this was an exciting new turnaround. I also, of course, I think like many other artists um, started picking up all sorts of jobs as many as I could. Um, I think there was a period of my life where I was juggling, you know, eight part-time jobs. Um, Now I've dwindled it down to about four or five, so much more relaxed. (laughs) Um, But, you know, I would be teaching at multiple schools or multiple um, private lesson programs. Um, I had a brief stint in international development because it was a job at the time. It was fine, not for me. Um, I had worked as a workshop instructor. Um, I now do communications for a wonderful art company. um, And I also tutor English. So it's really a grab bag of anything that I can do to make it work so I can still keep up my studio practice. Um, And at times it gets really overwhelming, I think, juggling juggling everything. Um, You know, sometimes it's a little bit less work than I want. Sometimes it's a little bit too much that it gets a little overwhelming at times, especially when my when my personal studio practice is uh, a little bit busier. But it's still really wonderful having having, you know, the, the ability to kind of control my schedule and be able to still work on my practice. Um, even, even if it's not a full-time thing. Um, and then in 2021, after kind of, you know, a little bit of a, a lull in my studio practice, I think a lot of artists can agree that it was, it was really hard to show work, um, at the start of the pandemic. Um, and, it was a little bit, you know, sad because you couldn't go to any more art openings. You couldn't um, really, you know, share in that community-based experience. Um, but things started to turn around because I had heard back from this magazine that I had submitted to called New American Paintings. Um, they're a juried exhibition uh, print magazine that um, they publish about six each year, one per region of the United States. Um, and I had submitted towards, you know, the 
end of my fall semester senior year um just kind of on a whim one of my professors um recommended I do it I did not think anything of it I kind of thought it was just a submission that was going to go out into the into the world and I'd never hear back from and that would have been fine um because this was a magazine that I grew up reading in high school and in college you know this was where I would go and look for my new favorite painters um and really gain inspiration from um and I heard back and I had the wonderful experience of being published in uh edition 148 which is for the south region um which Virginia is located in um and this was really I think um one of the first validating experiences for me as a postgraduate artist that I could, you know, still still pursue the arts and actually be able to to be featured in something that I grew up loving so much that the work that I had put in so far um, was paying off. And so that was really, really exciting. Um, a little nerve wracking, I think, because I think, you know, many people feel this imposter syndrome of you know, am I actually in the right space that I'm supposed to be in? Did some luck just sort of happen? And now here we are, but I don't deserve this. Um, and so I was feeling that a little bit, um, but it was really cool to have my work in print and sort of have something to, um, to look back on and really say like, wow, okay, now I need to keep pushing forward because I'm published and I need people to not think that I just kind of died off. <laughs> um, and so after, shortly after this, in the same year, in 2021, um, I submitted to a group show open call, and I got in at this uh, DC-based art fair um, called Umbrella Art Fair. Um, and this was my first DC group show, or first DC show period in the district. Um, and that was really cool because prior to this, I had had wonderful experiences showing in my college town, um, in local areas in Northern Virginia. I had some um, um, you know, wonderful little things here and there. Um, but this was the first in a major city showcase. Um, and so that was another instance of validation, seeing myself around other artists from the city that I admired. Um, and so this was, this was a really cool chance for my work to, to get out there and starting to see it come to shape. Um, I had shown some older work. So over here, this was some of the stuff that I was working on in college where I was still trying to figure out what I was most interested in versus on this side where I was starting to really explore more so of the, um, the still life that I was really interested in. Um, but something kind of in retrospect that I've noticed is the pieces that I had worked on at this time definitely did call back to the landscape that I had been working on in Marshoots, where I was really starting to take these objects and the things that I was most fascinated in, but sort of shape them back into, into the beauty that I was finding in the landscape, sort of the, the Mount St. Victoire, seeing those little mountainscapes in these plastic bags, pulling out all the colors that I was seeing. So it wasn't just a flat, you know, grayish color, but instead there were all these hints of blues and purples and yellows, things that were that were calling to me when I was looking at the at the little motif in front of me, even though it wasn't this, you know, grandiose mountain. Instead it was much smaller, but it was still giving that same effect. Um, from here, I started working more on my studio practice again. Um, I was far more limited because I was working out of my childhood bedroom. So I no longer had this, um, great studio space that I had had in college. Um, I didn't have the same access to working with oil paints that I had previously had. So I started to adapt a little bit. I moved towards gouache instead. Um, and I was getting a lot of similar effects. You know, I was, I was still able to pull out these colors. I was still able to make really intricate details. Um, but at the same time, it was giving me the ability to kind of control how much detail I was putting in and letting myself be a little bit looser, um, which was exciting because I hadn't been able to do that since the summer of 2018. I was definitely more of a tight knit painter. Um, and so this was the first time I was able to combine the two of those together um, and paint a little bit looser on the inside with some of my details, but at the same time on the outside, it was this very polished sort of um, smooth shape. 
Um, and so all of these, this comes from a series of doorknobs that I did at my um, childhood house. Um, so all different bedrooms, you know, one's my parents' bedrooms doorknob, one's my brother's, um, one is mine, one's the guest room, one's the bathroom. Um, and so it was really cool seeing seeing kind of what we had used every single day, but actually putting a greater focus on it. Um, and this was my take on self-portraits because I didn't want to go about painting myself. Um, but at the same time, that was something that I didn't feel comfortable with. So I had to push beyond that. So I'm reflected in all of these different doorknobs. Um, and so that is my little take on the self-portrait is kind of seeing both physically myself being reflected, but then also these are doorknobs that had lived in my house for as long as I lived there. So for, you know, 20 plus years um, and how they had become a part of me to some degree. Along this line, I had also started to explore a little bit more of my per personal heritage and culture. Um, I am half Kyrgyz. Um, my mom is from Kyrgyzstan, um, and she is also uh, part Uyghur, um, which is a cultural tribe from China. Um, and a lot of people here in the U.S. is Uyghur. That's how it's pronounced over here. Um, and so I started looking a little bit more into, you know, my cultural background, because in the U.S., a lot of times you have this compromise of in order to assimilate you, you kind of, you know, follow more of the traditional American household um, ways of living. And then, you know, at the same time, I was at home surrounded by all these beautiful, you know, pieces um, of my heritage that my mom and dad would have brought back home um, whenever they would go travel. And so I really wanted to start exploring that some more. Also, because I personally had not really seen a lot of representation of Central Asian art in the US. Um, so this was something that I felt was really important was to start at least introducing my own little community to my, you know, my life and what that was like. Um, and sort of the the part that I had not necessarily kept hidden, but what wasn't outspoken about myself immediately, um, but at the same time was super um, huge in my upbringing. Um, and so this piece is, this is a carrying bag for um, teacups. And so tea is such a huge part of Central Asian culture. And um, this would be a way of transporting it um, to different picnics, or if you're bringing it to a friend's house or to an event, um, or if you just want a really nice way of storing it. Um, and then over here, this is a graphite pencil drawing of my grandmother from when she was around my age. Um, and this was one of the first, you know, I think portraits that I had done in a long time. Um, but it was really valuable for me to kind of be able to, to reconnect with her kind of, um, you know, seeing the similarities between us um, at the similar age point, even though we grew up such different lives. And so from here, I, we have a, a little bit of a quick shift, um, but after doing all this work um, with my studio practice and really pushing through kind of getting beyond the lull that was, you know, the start of the pandemic um, and starting to explore some of these greater themes, I um, decided at the start of 2022 that I really wanted to start working towards a solo exhibition. Um, and with the solo exhibition, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to create a body of work that, that felt very strongly, like my own was something that I was exploring that was a little bit different from um, everything I had previously done. Um, I wanted the chance for, you know, the community to, to see my work at a greater scale and to actually be showing my work um, for the first time really, you know, since the pandemic, because you could do group shows here and there, but it was not the same. Um, and come the, the summer of 2022, I got connected with the gallery OM um, in DC, which has a few different locations. Um, and I started talking to the director of the gallery and I explained my work, I showed my work, I um, talked about what I was really interested in and kind of how I wanted to navigate um, still life in a more contemporary lens rather than, you know, while I love the, you know, the the bowl of fruit, the the animal game, the the really traditional still life, I also wanted to, to show people how 
it really is all around you and how you can interpret the world through still life um, just in a way that's more relatable. Um, and so at that point, I had signed on to do a solo show about six months later, um, which felt like an eternity. Turns out it went by in a second um, and I had to make a lot of work really fast. Um, and so I ended up making the show Deep Clean. Um, and so I have some exhibition shots. There's me at my opening, which was a really beautiful experience. I had so many wonderful friends and family come out um, to see the show and see my work in person for really the first time for a lot of people ever, um, but then for many people in, in several years. Um, and so I got to finally display the doorknobs, which I thought would have just been, you know, a product of the pandemic. And then we would have just moved on from it. It was a good learning experience. But instead, I really did have the chance to, to exhibit them, which was super great. Um, and then I had some other works in the show. I started to really focus back in on just the object, but then also how can I bring out the colors in each one? How can I really focus in on the form? Um, a while ago, um, at the beginning of this presentation, I brought up how I was starting to explore the negative background, but I wasn't really sure why at the time. Um, and as I started thinking about it more, all of my work really started to revolve around this theme of memory. Um, and I was seeing this negative background space as this greater conversation around selective memory and how when you think back to certain moments, you're really see, really focusing on certain objects or certain scenes, but you're not seeing everything else around it. That's not um, something that you can bring up easily into your memory anymore. And so that was really fascinating. And I was thinking about how can I create that similar sensation, but on a 2D piece of work. Um, and so everything started to really culminate together. Um, I was starting to make pieces that were uh, ideas that I had had for a while, but didn't really know how to work out. Um, and this was a super wonderful experience for me. And I think that I would not have had the motivation to, to push for it and to really advocate for myself had it not been for experiences like working for Amy Sherald or going to Marsh Shoots and really having, um, you know, the, the push out of my comfort zone that I needed. Um, and so, yeah, so from here, I have no idea what's coming up, um, which is both nerve wracking and really exciting. Um, and it has been a, a super wonderful journey. And I'm really glad to be connected with the Marshoots family. Um, this past year, uh, so many of the community came out into DC, um, so many of which already live in DC, but um, we had a little gathering and that was um, just a really wonderful reminder that everyone is still out there supporting one another and wants to see um, all these alum and community members just thriving and growing and learning every single day. Um, and so I'm really glad that you all could join in on this conversation today. And thank you so much. Thank you, Samantha. That was thank so you, lovely. <laughs> thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions right now off the bat? Any questions or um, comments or feedback for Samantha? I know I have a couple questions, but I want to let you all go first. <laughs> okay, Alan, you have a question? Go ahead and unmute yourself first. Hold on, unmute yourself. I was really interested in, well, a lot of things, but one thing I was really interested in was the wheel that you made for the top of your graduation hat. Can we, can we look at that? <laughs> yeah, I, I just, let me pull that up. Did you, uh, uh, first of all, were those cutouts from bigger paintings or did you make the little triangles separately? Okay. And mm -hmm. let's go back to it. We can find Here, it. This, I had a long PowerPoint. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. wow, did you paint each one of those sort of, they're not triangles, but they're, I guess they're whatever they are, 
separately or were, were they cutouts from bigger paintings or how did you conceive that? It's re really wonderful. Yeah, I'm actually really glad that you asked about this because I, I did forget to mention. Um, so I had, I have um, a circular palette that I work on. Um, so rather than just like a flat sheet, I have this kind of like, it's a it's a donut for, for lack of, you know, better terms. Um, and every time I would work on a painting in college, I would create these really beautiful palettes of all my, you know, all my paints that I was working on. And I did not have the heart to let them go. I could have totally tossed them, but I was like, they're so beautiful. They're pieces on their own. Um, and so at the time when I was in college, I would hang them up on my wall in my little studio space. But then when it came time for, you know, everyone to pack up their stuff during COVID, I packed everything back up. I brought it home. Um, and then when it came time to graduation, I thought about what I wanted to do with my cap if I wanted to do something, you know, to, to represent myself from my college experience. And I was like, you know what, this is, this is the most pinnacle of all my experiences. I was just sitting in the studio all the time um, and working. And so these are all different slivers of the various pieces that I had worked on. Um, and so they're like, each one is a little snapshot of a, of a different painting. Um, and they're all just pieced together. I would cut out different slivers. I liked, you know, the best parts of each one. I would chop that up and then, and then put it on the, on the cap. Oh, wow. Yeah. So these are slivers from the, were your palette, your round palettes, were they paper? They were paper palettes. Yes. Mm -hmm. So then you cut out slivers from your different palettes. Not exactly. Palettes. Wow. Yeah, it's cool. And it's, you know, it's one of those things where now I can look back and be like, you know, this is, this is the full representation. Like this is, this is just as much of a great representation as my full college portfolio, you know, cause this, this was what it really looked like, you know, deep in it. <laughs> this is what the studio space looked like at the time. Um, but yeah. So is, did you spend a lot of time placing them in terms of what was next to what or was it kind of random or did you it looks I mean did you spend a lot of time moving the pieces around to try to come up with it the way you wanted it or did you just sort of put them on there that's a great question um to be honest with you I don't fully remember um if if from what from what I can recall I spent a little bit of time thinking about it, but then to some point, I just kind of was like, I, I need all of them down <laughs> um, and then and then place them down. I think also in coordination, some of them were of different like sliver sizes. You can see this one's much larger than this one over here. And so I had to, had to piece them around depending on what I felt looked best in coordination with the, the actual size of each one. Yeah. Yeah. I like the three yellow ones, the, how they sit, the mm -hmm. really bright yellow with the blue, and then the one that's opposite and with the one down below. In here, uh, or this the, one. Yeah, the three yellows, mm -hmm. and also the three reds. The, the two mm, reds. Interesting. Red, the little red tash. No, it's really nice. Anyway, I love that. That's about that hat, mm -hmm. for one thing, yeah. Especially. Thank you. And then just one other question, and then I'll let other people. The, I guess it, it was the room, the yellow room. If you go back, it, you you said it was one of your early paintings, but you, mm. you had the room and you had a lemon on the table. A lemon uh, on the table. Yeah, let's see. I think it was in the exhibition, the first exhibition. Oh, it is. That one, yeah. Oh, this one is actually not mine. Um, it was this one and then this one over here. Okay. Yeah. So. Nice. You're working hard. Thank I'm trying my best. <laughs> yeah. I had a question, um, if you don't mind, Samantha. I'm so interested in your um, working with Amy Sherald. Um, cause her work of course came to be so known by everybody when she did Michelle Obama's portrait a few years ago. Um, and I'm so interested in, cause she does mostly 
portraiture, I think, and sort of large scale portraits. And I loved how you said that when you started doing still life and sort of focusing in on still life, you were talking about it being portraiture, but through objects. And I wonder if some of that sort of influence came from your work with Amy Sherald or how working in her studio and seeing her process, especially with her, I sort of think of them as like kind of collage like portraits that she does with different textures and things like that. Um, did her work influence your decision to sort of pursue um, portraiture through still life? Is that, was there a connection there? Yeah, that's a great question. I definitely, I think so a lot um, because you're, you're right. All the work, especially while I was working with her was really focused on the portraiture since um, since I've worked with her, she started to expand a little bit more into, into larger scenes, into bringing, you know, one of her recent works has two motorbikes in it, um, which is super cool, um, but that was a little bit after me. Um, but there were many times where I would talk to her about her work, and I was really fascinated knowing, you know, who, why did you pick these specific models? Do you know them really well? Um, you know, why are they dressed in the specific clothes that they're wearing? Because if you're familiar with Amy's work, usually she has the model, um, and the model is painted in a monochromatic grayscale. Um, and then the, the clothes is usually super extravagant, um, very, I don't know if I have the picture of her studio and if they, if they really show it. Um, but usually it's really bright and colorful. Um, a lot of the times it's a little bit more vintage, like, you know, really this, um, I don't know, I think a little bit out there clothing. Um, and so while I was asking her about it, she was saying, you know, these were people that she was just really drawn to. One person um, that she painted was her dog walker. So whoever would walk her dog whenever she was in the studio. Um, but she was just so drawn to this person's energy um, and really wanted to bring that out, not just through her facial expression, but also by what she was wearing in the painting. And so she ends up wearing this black and white zigzag dress. She's got little paw print earrings. Um, yeah. And then the background is this hot pink color, like super striking. Um, um, very much, you know, it not only becomes about the individual person, um, and like what she physically looks like, but it becomes more so about the kind of energy that the world perceives her by. Um, and I loved that. I loved being able to see how Amy was choosing the specific clothing for each person. Um, and I think that is definitely what inspired um, some of my work where I started focusing in on fabrics. And then from fabrics, I started thinking more about, okay, what other objects are out there that kind of condone the same you know, energy? Um, what else is really bright and exciting or what is more muted and matches towards another person's identity? Um, and so I think that that definitely sparked something. Um, yeah, it was it was such a different way for me to think. Similarly to how I hadn't really done a whole lot of landscapes, I had done some portraits, but not in the same capacity that that Amy had been doing, where she was doing full body, sort of realist, focusing in on the the actual like authenticity of the person rather than just focusing on trying to make, you know, a, a realistic looking portrait. That wasn't something that she cared about. And so that was um, important, I think, for me was to realize that I didn't have to make things look realistic. I actually needed it to feel more like someone else or like this object had a life. Hmm. Hopefully that, that answered what you were thinking. <laughs> It totally does. Yeah, that is so cool. She is such a fascinating artist. I followed her stuff a little bit and I know that she like, I think she had a heart transplant or something and she makes that part of her work or always talks about how she was given a second life and this whole thing. And she's just like so fascinating to me. So I'm, that's so cool that you got to work with her. Yeah, no, I love that, so wonderful. you know, story too, because it is it's very much, I think a lot of artists get this kind of pressure, especially if they're younger and haven't really had a lot of time 
um, working as an artist yet where they're like, oh, well, I have to reach this sort of level of success at a certain point. Um, or mm -hmm. like, this is my perspective of success. So I need to do this specifically. Um, but it's been really helpful having, you know, these mentor roles in my life who are like, you know what, it's actually way better to play the long game and to mm -hmm. just slowly build yourself up, learn, fail, change your practice a million times, um, readjust and then just continue, continue doing what you're doing and just focus on actually enjoying the process rather than reaching some sort of level of assumed success. Mm -hmm. Wow. Are there any other questions for Samantha? Anybody? <laughs> well then, Samantha, if you, if you have anything else you'd like to impart to the audience feel free otherwise we can wrap up and no, I think I'm good well thank you all so much for for coming out John and Alan it's so great to see your faces um oh, there's my aunt and uncle too um <laughs> and just thank you I really appreciate you all taking the time to listen oh thank you so much Samantha we're so grateful that you were willing to be our featured artist this month and we're so happy that you're in the Marshoots community. Thank yeah, you. Same here. So All right. I have Thank one you. thing, Samantha. The yeah. Oh, Alan, go ahead. Sorry. Am I muted? No. No, you're um, good. The art, you, you did the interview with Sam. That was lovely. What you put, you oh, put yeah. that together. Yeah, that was that was so much fun. Um, yeah, and just for context for everyone else, um, Sam Bjorklund, the one of the co-founders of the Marshoot School, and I did a little interview um, on Art Frankly, uh, which is a company that I work for. Um, and I think the Marshoots page has already highlighted it, especially on their Instagram. So if you're curious to read it, um, that's where you can find it. And I can send a link around too when I follow up with all of you after this call. I can send a link for it. And Samantha, we should put you in contact with Mary Hamilton, who's a oh, great yeah. friend um, of uh, Marshoots and has been a bunch of times. She went to Mary Washington. Oh my gosh. She's also really interested in still lifes and she's a really active painter. She lived in France for 15 years, but now lives in Dallas. So it would be fun for her, I'm sure too. Yeah, so I would love that. Yeah. That'd be incredible. Absolutely. Please do. Oh my gosh. Yeah, Good she's idea. a wonderful painter and a wonderful person, as we can all say. So you two would really enjoy being in contact. I would love that. That'd be amazing. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much. And thank you, especially to you, Samantha. We really appreciate your time and being part of the, the Featured Artist of the Month series. <laughs> thank you so much, Rose. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.